Let's go through our questions. It looks like James has a question. Isaac has a question. I think Rachel had one. Let's go first with James. All right, so I understand how it all works, but you said that we're essentially using the this keyword to generalize the function, right? So what I don't get is, I mean, I, why are we not just having the method accept a parameter as the object which it's being called on? So, you know, you're, you're sitting here calling like this. It is very confusing. You're saying this dot increment uh, or, or this this dot name, right? And instead, it seems like normally we would just call increment and pass in a, uh, a parameter. Yeah. Or yeah argument, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, you're totally fine. It's a good, it's a great question. So why do we generalize it using like the this keyword rather than generalize uh, the function to then accept a parameter later on so that you can run like increment and then pass in the object as as, a, as an argument? That's a really good question, uh, James. It's going to take us a little bit down like a bit of a rabbit hole. This is going to be the most unsatisfying answer ever. Let's hold on it. Okay, no problem. It's going to become a bit more of a, really what it comes down to is kind of like the best practices and design patterns that you start running into issues with that we're going to find out what issue we're going to run into with that on the next example. So let's just put that one in the back of your mind for just a second, if you're okay with that. And then we'll come back to it if it doesn't become more apparent by the end of the, the workshop. Are you, are you okay with that? Okay. All right. Uh, Isaac. Yeah, I was just curious how the like how the bond gets stored. Is that like a property? Like if you console log the object, will you see like user function store in there as some other thing? Or? A great question, Isaac. You're absolutely Are, on point. Like this is the, this is the question that you should be asking right now. Really, it should just be questions about like, hey, by the way, like still like what in the hell is this bond thing? Like you just said bond. Like what is the bond thing? It absolutely is right. Um, a lot of times people see the bond, it's not called bond. A lot of people see the bond and they're like really like taken back by it. Like it looks, oh my God, it looks super complex and aggressive. And only because the actual name of it seems a bit more complicated. But in reality, it is not. It's absolutely right, Isaac. It is just a property. It's just a property that's on the object like any other property. It's just a property that JavaScript creates internally. And then JavaScript uses that property in a very special way, almost like a, like a default place to look when JavaScript doesn't find the thing it's looking for on the, the, the object itself. So first, and hopefully that kind of answers the question right there, Isaac, but let's actually find out what is, you know, what is bond? Actually, I haven't asked this question in a while. Uh, who thinks they know? This, I, I like to ask this question because when I do ask it, I like when people say the wrong word, because a lot of times people just default to this answer and they go, oh, it must be this thing. And they say the word and it's like the default answer for everything. And a lot of times people are wrong. I want to see if anybody knows it. I feel like Andy's smiling a lot. He may know it. Nate's, he's, he may be on there. Let's ask this. Let's do this. Who thinks they know what it is that has not been to this lecture before? Uh, Nate, you feel like you know what it is? Let's see here. Weirdly enough, I see some other people with their hands up, but their names aren't popping up on my screen, so I don't know what to call you. Let's see here. Let me see if I switch here. There we go. I can see some names now. That was weird. It was like a glitch in, in, in Zoom. Samuel looks like he knows the answer. Let's go with Samuel. Samuel, what do you think the bond actually is or what is it actually called? Oh, you're still muted, man. Is it prototype? Ah, Samuel, that is exactly the wrong answer that I was looking for. Yeah, I, I figured it. I like, <laughs> you're like, it figured, it, just, it, it felt too good, right? It just felt too good, you're like, ah, this can't be right. This can't be right. I will give you this, Samuel, one, don't ever feel bad about that answer because so many people say prototype is the answer. That is the That's answer. Another casual well, question. But, well, hold on, hold on. Let, let me let me get through this, Samuel, and then I'll, I'll let you ask your question. One second. So most people go that direction. It's very closely associated with this thing called the prototype. We're going to find out what that is in just a minute. But it's not actually the prototype. Nate, do you want to give it a shot? The dunder. The ooh, you're close. Give me some more. What is it? What else? The dunder what? I don't know what you call it. Dunder, underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore. I don't That's know. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> underscore, underscore, proto. Here, let's write it out. It's not called the bond. Let me erase this. It's not called the bond. It's called, or it actually, like, literally is this property, underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore. 
and uh, Nate to kind of like answer your, or maybe you're like, oh, but isn't that kind of what I said already? Uh, what it's actually referred to, like all the cool kids call it uh, the Dunder Proto. Dunder Proto is double underscore proto, double underscore. So underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore. Now, most people see the double underscore thing and they're like, oh shit, this looks really serious. And then like, they don't want to touch it or do anything with it because they think it's super complex. It's not. There's a reason that I call it the bond first because if I call it dunder proto or the underscore, underscore, proto, people are like, oh shit, I'm way outside my league here. It is exactly the same thing as the bond. It's just a slightly different name. It still executes the exact, or like it still functions the exact same way. JavaScript looks on the object. If it doesn't find what it's looking for, it goes, hey, is there a Dunder Proto on this object? Oh, there is. Great. Let's follow it and let's see what it points to. And I think, uh, I think yeah, Isaac's question is, is it just like a property like anything else? Uh, yes. Some caveats to that, but yes, in that you can console log user one dot underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore, and it's going to log to your console, whatever that property is, which in this instance, you would literally log to your console, user function store. So, did I already take questions on this? I did. We're not going to take any more questions on this. Nah, should we? No, maybe. What time is it? 8.19? Uh, we're doing okay on time. No, let's not take any questions. We're hold questions. Samuel, no, I'm sorry, man. Samuel, I told you that I'd come to your question right after. Let's take questions. Samuel, what's your question, man? Uh, I was going to ask you what's the difference between proto and prototype. So. Oh, yeah, dude. Oh, my God. We're going to spend the whole next section talking just about that. We're going to introduce what the prototype is, and we're going to see the difference. When right? you asked me what is the name of it, I was like, it's either prototype or proto. Mm. Well, hey, you had a 50-50 shot. You gambled. You guessed wrong. I we're going to find out what the other one is right now in just learn. a minute. You never get that wrong again. I did learn, though. You did learn. There it is. If that's what you get out of it, then work the gamble. All right, folks. So this is solution number two. Now, hopefully you're tracking along with this. Hopefully it's not too complex. Uh, benefits to this solution is you now have one copy of the function. One solid place to add functions, to remove functions, that all of your user objects, as long as they have the bond, they will have access to those functions. Now, the cons of this process. It's a beautiful process, very sophisticated, very efficient. Checks all of our boxes, right? It's efficient in terms of memory. You get data and functionality right next to each other. It's uh, easy, you know, easy-ish, depending on how you look at it, to reason about. But you will never use this. Yes. Oh, like everybody kind of shifts in their seats. Osha, again, very expressive. She's like, oh, fuck this guy. We just talked about this for 45 minutes. We talked about it. I'm so sorry, Ocha. I don't know why I keep calling on you for this. It's because you're like right in my line of sight every time. You're like, why is he picking on me? No. Uh, why did we learn this? Like, why did we talk about this for the last 45 minutes versus say we're never going to use this? This is a very sophisticated process that we just outlined here, but it is not the standard anymore. This used to be the standard. This used to be how people would set up OOP style of applications. They would define something like user function store and global memory. They would write out the code that creates the new object using object.create, adds properties to it, returns the object out, saves in global memory. But it came with some problems. It came with some issues. Ultimately, it's just not the process that we use anymore. We have some, some new ways of automating some of this stuff, which is gonna be really nice in solution three. But what it came down to is there were some, there were some issues. There were some fundamental issues here. Typically, as a convention, most of you have probably heard this before, Global variables are usually a bad process. Global variables are, are just, they're, they're too exposed. I mean, think about this. If we really were building out an entire application this way, and inside of our global memory, you simply had an object called user function store, and inside that object, you essentially had all of the business logic of your entire application, that's super dangerous. Because what if somebody goes in and actually de accidentally deletes a property from it? Or worse yet, deletes the entire object. In one fail swoop, you just nuke the entire logic of your entire application because you have all of it just stored willy-nilly out there exposed in global memory. This is not a great process. You know, you can make the argument, oh, but it's a const variable, so it wouldn't happen, you know, whatever. But whatever, it doesn't really matter. 
the, the, the process is here, like the thing, the, the point that I'm trying to get to is global var variables are not typically a good process or not a good best practice. I would also just say that there's, you know, there's a few things that become a bit repetitive. If you actually build out a scaled application this way, you're going to find yourself repeating some of these things over and over and over again. You know, you find yourself repeating the same pattern here where you create a function, you create a new user object using object.create, passing it some other, you know, kind of storage place like user function store. Um, you add a few things to it, you return the object out. Like that's the normal process, right? Create object, add stuff to it, return object out. Create object, add stuff to it, return object out. Eh, a bit repetitive. So what happened was, those are like kind of like the two main issues here. So what happened was, is in 2015, 2015, ECMAScript engineers, you know, the, the engineers that actually write the spec of JavaScript, that write the rules and the new features of JavaScript, they introduced a new keyword. And this new keyword automated some of the process that you see here. Automated it in the sense of, hey, you use this keyword and JavaScript just does some of this stuff under the hood for you. You don't have to write the code for it or anything. It just does it automatically. Let's talk about what that new keyword is. Taven, you know what that new keyword is in JavaScript that helps automate some of these processes? Yeah, you, you kind of caught me dozing off there. Yeah, it's a uh, class. Taven, Taven. No? Am I wrong? Not. It is not class. It is not what I'm looking for here. Uh, in, a way, you're, in a way, you're right, but it's not what I'm looking for. Okay, I, I think I've still got it then. Is it new? <sighs> yeah, I'm going to give it to you. It is new, but also you get like, you like, we retract points from you because you even admitted that you were dozing off there. Like, come on, man. What? what? No points for honesty? <laughs> you get half a point. You get half a point for honesty. You get half oh, yeah. a point for trying and failing. All right. It is new. It is the keyword new. So let's talk about it really quickly here because new is going to be our third solution. Our fourth solution, by the way, is going to go really, really quickly. We're not even going to whiteboard for it. It's going to be super quick. The third solution, the one that we're getting ready to get into now, that's going to take a good amount of time because this is going to be a bit more complex, but we're going to find once you understand it, oh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful implementation of OOP. And it's using the new keyword. So most of you have probably seen this before. Maybe you didn't really know what was going on with the hood. We're going to find out right now. Using the new keyword, I'm all right. everything that's associated with new is going to be in red. So if you utilize new before the invocation of a function, JavaScript is going to automate two major processes here. The first well, I don't say it's the first, it's not the first thing that happens, but it's the easiest piece that's automated. The easiest piece that's automated is the return of the object, the new user object. The return is automatically done for us, meaning we don't have to write the code return new user. So we can go down to our code here, the one that we just went through. You can already remove this bit of code. You don't have to do it. You use the new keyword, JavaScript does it for you automatically. The other piece, the creation of the object itself. The creation of the object itself, when you use the new keyword, is done for you automatically. Meaning, you do not have to write this code here. You don't have to write it. You just completely remove it from your, your, uh, your function itself. You don't have to write it at all. Meaning this bit of code here does not have to be written. It is not happening. Use the new keyword. JavaScript does it for you. Okay. That is as simple as it gets. Use the new keyword. The creation of the object, automatically done. The return of the object, automatically done. But that should raise a couple of flags. You should be thinking to yourself now, well, hold on, Philip. Like, if we're doing that part automatically, then how does this part work then? If we're creating the object automatically, or not we, but JavaScript is automatically creating the object, well, then what are these other things? How do these other things work? You should be asking yourself a few of those questions. First question you should ask yourself is, well, Philip, if we no longer have to write this code here, what is the object even called? 
because before we were calling it new user. Look, let's go back down to our code for a second here. Let's uh, bring that line back. We were calling it new user. We were defining it. And then we were saying like new user dot name is equal to name. So we were then adding things to it. Well, we still need to be able to have the option to add properties to the objects. So what do we call it? It's not new user. That's for sure. It's actually this. And where I said, there's like eight different rules associated with this. We said that we we're going to talk about two of them tonight. Number one was the left of the dot rule. If you execute a function on, a, on an object, this equals whatever's to the left of the dot, the name of the object. This is the second rule. If you're using the new keyword, the ob or this is automatically the new object that's created. So completely different rule than what we talked about before, just another one to throw in the back of, the, in, in the back of your brain, another one to add to the JavaScript tool belt when you use the new keyword, this equals our newly created object. The other big thing that you should be asking yourself, I know Tyler's asking this to himself right now. He's sitting there just like pondering. He's like, well, Phil, but if that's done automatically, what does this, what happens here? If we're automatically creating this object, we're not writing this line of code here. What does our Dunder proto point to? What does our Dunder proto point to? Because we specified, we had granular control over what the Dunder proto pointed to because we had to pass it in here as an argument. We had to pass in user functions. We had to tell JavaScript, hey, JavaScript, I created this common storage place already in global memory. It's called user function store. Create the bond to user function store. But if we're automating that line of code, what does JavaScript default to pointing the Dunder proto to? This is the last big thing. To understand what JavaScript points the Dunder Proto to, we have to deepen every, we have to go like, we have to go like inception, like deep into how JavaScript works under the hood. At least one or two people smirked at that comment. Uh, we have to go deeper under the hood and understand JavaScript. So uh, let's see here, who am I gonna call? Who looks like they're not paying attention? Uh, Todd, I see the flashes on your face. It makes me think that you're on different websites and not paying attention to me. Uh, Todd, what is user creator? It's not a trick question. What is user creator? Well, uh, it's, sorry, I was in the restroom right before this. Um, it's okay. So user creator stored in global memory. Here it is. Yep. What is user creator? Would you say it's a number? Would you say it's a string? Would you say it's an object? What would you say it is? Um, function. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. It's a function. We all can get on board with that, right? Shake your head up and down if you agree. User creator is a function. Yes, it absolutely is. But, but, there's a but. User creator is also is also an object. Yeah. User creator is also an object. It's a weird concept because most people never really understand uh, JavaScript to this level, like this deep under the hood. User creator is also an object. And it usually pisses people off a bit because they're like, I thought I knew what a function was. A function is a function. It's bundled up code, you execute it. And now you're telling me that it's also an object? Well, yes. Realistically, in JavaScript, all functions are objects. They're just special objects. They're special objects that can be invoked. They're special objects that can be called. In reality, the object has a little property on it called square bracket, square bracket, call, square bracket, square bracket. And the value of that property is the code that's actually executed in JavaScript. We're not going to go that deep into the details of it, but what you can really just kind of simplify this, this complex process like is user creator has like its function form, but it also has like its object form. The cool part about it is JavaScript, excuse me, JavaScript will 
or rather user creator will behave however you treat it. It's very flexible. Meaning that uh, Todd, if you were to write the code, you know, user creator, and then you throw parentheses on the end, JavaScript is going to go, it's going to see that line of code and go, user creator. It's going to go, huh, what the hell is user creator? It's going to go, oh, user creator is this thing in, in memory right here. And then it sees the parentheses at the end and it goes, oh, Todd must be trying to execute user creator. It's like, okay, cool. So I'm just going to, I'm going to execute the kind of the, the, the function form of user creator. And it, you know, opens up an execution context, et cetera, et cetera. But, but if, if like, you know, if like Carlos, Carlos, if you wrote the code user creator, oh, go back to my color here, user creator dot name, you know, equals Carlos, JavaScript is going to see that bit of code. It's going to go, it's going to go user creator. It goes, okay, what tells user creator? It's going to go find it in memory. It's going to go, oh, there it is. There's the label. It's then going to see the dot. It's going to go, ah, an intellectual I see. So, ah, we're using the dot, which means we're not trying, Carlos is not trying to access the, you know, the function form. No, 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 no. Carlos is trying to like do something with the object form. So JavaScript's going to go to the object form. It's going to go, okay, cool. Let's add a name property and let's set it equal to Carlos. So JavaScript will behave however you treat it, which is actually kind of cool once you get the hang of it. Okay, so that's all to say there is an object form to the function and there is a function form of the function. We access them depending on how we're writing our code. Okay, so last little piece here, because again, the ultimate question was what does the Dunder Proto point to? Well, on the object form, let's zoom in here, on the object form of any function, there are a few automatically, JavaScript does it automatically, a few properties that it automatically creates. One of them, mm. Samuel, are you there, man? I see you've turned off your camera. Yes, I am here. Okay, you just didn't want to. Well, I'm, multi I'm kind of multitasking. Ah, I got you. That's my favorite type of audience member, somebody who's kind of listening and kind of not, That's my favorite. No, I'm just, uh, I almost dozed off there, so no, I'm just joking. I was just joking. I was making fun of Tavi. I, I don't know why I talk to any of you people. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know why. I should charge money for this. Oh, okay. Yeah, All right. So, Samuel, you need to pay attention to this. See, that's I'm your problem, Samuel. You're in bed. You can't come know, to a I'm lecture like this. I had my, my shirt off, and I didn't want to be, like, explicit. Like, I had my shirt off. Well, that's very thoughtful of you. <laughs> okay. Besides the point, Samuel, this part is for you. Okay. On our object form of the function user creator, JavaScript creates some autom automatically creates some properties. One of those properties, guess what it is? Prototype. Yes. It creates a property called prototype. prototype. Samuel, take a wild guess at what the value of prototype is. I'll yeah. give you a hint. We have not stopped talking about it for the last two hours. The value of the prototype is a uh, user creator's parent. Um, uh, you're getting too complex there, Samuel. You're getting into some stuff that's not completely wrong, but I'm looking for the more simplified version. Uh, Prototype is an object. It's another object. Another goddamn object in the mix. Uh, okay. <laughs> it sounds like, oh, kind of get it, kind of not. Don't worry, we're going to go through it again. So, ECMAScript engineers looked at the prototype object on the user creator's object form and they thought to themselves, they're like, hey, this object, it looks like a good place to store some shit. It's like, a, it's, a, it's like free storage right here, like not being utilized at all. You know what we should do? We should set the Dunder Proto not to user function store, because again, we're kind, of, we're kind of going back to what we were originally talking about, which is the automatic creation of the this object. We're not going to set the Dunder Proto to user function store, because again, we never wrote that line of code. But what we are going to do is we're going to automatically, when using the new keyword, we're automatically going to set the Dunder Proto to the prototype object on the object form 
of the function that we're currently executing. I'll say that again, because I know that's a hard way to follow. JavaScript automatically points the Dunder Proto to the prototype objects, let's follow here, the prototype objects on the object form of the user creator function or of the function that we are currently executing to create this whole object. Whew. Okay. That's everything. That's it. Just that little piece. I'm sure we have a lot of questions. At the very least, we just want to see it once more, like all the way through. This is solution three. This is gonna be the one that takes the most time. And in reality, we kind of went through the most time consuming piece so far, which was the explaining of how all this stuff works. Let's go through solution three. This is the code. We can already see the user creator function here is already far more simplistic. It's only two lines of code. We have some other pieces down here that we'll walk through specifically, and then we'll see how it plays out when we use the new keyword to execute user creator. I've already got the code. Let's paste it down here. Let's make it a little bit bigger so it's easy for us to see. And let's walk through this code line by line. Let's have, uh, let's see who we're gonna ask here. Let's ask somebody new, Heidi. Heidi, can you walk me through? What is this code doing here? First line of code. Um, okay. So we're gonna declare a function user creator in the global memory and Perfect. store it definition. Perfect, user creator. And you're absolutely right. It is a function. How do I know it's a function? Because there's a function keyword right before it. And I also just drew the function box that I always draw. But Heidi, we also know that it has its function form, but what else does it also have under the hood? Oh, it's object. Exactly. It has its like object form, right? It has both of them. Oh, you know what? Let's see here. Let's make this a bit bigger. Here, let's do some fancy. Fancy computer work here, there we go. Here's our object form of user creator. And Heidi, we said, oops, scroll too far up there. We said that on the user creator's object form, there's an automatically created property. What is that property? The prototype. The prototype. Prototype. And what is its value, Heidi? An object. Another object, you're absolutely right. Here it is. Ugh. Okay, it's okay. Not, not my best work, but it's, it's not bad. All right, could we just appreciate for just one second how much actually goes into creating a function in JavaScript? Like you just write the fun, you just function and write the function. You just think, oh, it's easy, simple. JavaScript is working its ass off under the hood. It's creating the function, it's creating the object, it's creating the, uh, the prototype on the object. For, it's doing all kinds of stuff under the hood. So a lot of stuff going on here. Heidi, next line of code that we're gonna hit. JP, I see your hand up as well, man. We'll come to questions in just a few minutes here. Um, okay, so we are storing. Are we creating? Go ahead. Um, are we creating a class? I don't know if you did a lecture, but I was in the restroom. Oh, good luck. Um, How many people are going to say they were just dozing off and not paying attention? Come on. No, I really had to go restroom. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, Heidi. Um, it's totally fine. But, uh, okay, let's do this. Let's, let's phone a friend, Heidi. Uh, <laughs> let's go with Andrew. Andrew, you, I haven't seen you leave your camera. You haven't turned off. You haven't took your shirt off. You haven't gone to the bathroom. Walk me through what's the next line of code, man. Okay. Um, we're declaring a method called login and we're adding it to the user creator's prototype object. Uh, you're, 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 one, like, you're one line too far down. One line ahead, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you're okay. We're, we're, um, you're, you're right, but that's the next thing that we're gonna do. Same thing with increment, yeah. We're declaring a method called increment and we're saving it to user creator's prototype object. Exactly right, exactly. That's a great way to technically communicate through it as well. It's, it's very smooth. But if we were gonna go through like very manual, just in case anybody was like, oh, hold on a second, how the hell did Andrew know that? We're gonna go through this, again, complex piece of JavaScript code, Oh, my Lord, it's 8.45, and I, I, am, I can already tell I'm not going to sleep well tonight. I'm too fired up right now, passionate about prototypes. I feel like that's not something you should be really passionate about. But how does JavaScript go through this lookup process? It hits this line of code. It sees 
user creator and it goes, huh, what the hell is user creator? It goes and looks inside global memory, sees user creator there. It then sees dot and it goes, ah, Andrew, you intellectual you, you're trying to access the object form of user creator. So user creator goes to the, not to the, it doesn't go over here to the function. It goes to the object and it says dot prototype. So it finds a prototype property on the user creator's object form and then adds an increment method to that object. So let's add it. Oof, this is going to be tough. I don't have a lot of room to work with here, but let's, let's see what we can do. Increment. Here is our function stored on the prototype object. Good. Next line of code, Andrew already hit it. So I'm just going to go through it really quickly again, but it's the same process. User creator dot prototype dot login. So we add a zoom back in here. We add a login method also to the prototype object. Good. And then, and then the magic happens. Now the good stuff kicks off. My, what is the next line of code that happened that is executed? What happens here? We are creating a constant user one and then uh -huh. we're creating that new object user creator with a argument Eva and nine. Perfect. 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 So let's paste it down here. Oh, paste it there. So here's the code we're running. We've declared, Oh, let's go back here. We've declared our user one variable. There it is in global memory. And we're initializing it to the evaluated result of executing new user creator passing in those arguments. So we're still executing a function. We're doing it in a fancier way. We're doing it with the new keyword. It's going to automate some stuff for us, but we're still ultimately executing a function. So everybody, it's going to be one of the few times we only have like maybe one or two times we're going to do this now moving forward. So let's make it good. I'm pumped up. I can see all of you are super pumped up, especially Samuel. Everybody unmute yourselves. We're executing a function in JavaScript, which means we are going to create a new Ex execution context. You guys are impossible. Four people participating. Just hate all of you. Okay. Here it is. I feel like I've insulted a lot of you today. Like much, much more than normal in a hard parts lecture. You know what I think we're gonna do? We're gonna put this lecture on YouTube as well. I feel like this is a good one to show to the world. Maybe we will. Okay. So it's a good thing, Samuel, that you weren't on here with your shirt off because yeah. seen by millions of people on YouTube. All right, we're creating a new execution context. Here it is, folks. We're gonna insert our our fancy one that is like pre-created. There it is. Boom. Okay, I don't think we need that much room. That's fine right there. Good. Okay. So what is happening inside the execution of new user creator? My, keep me going. What is the first thing that we're gonna do? So we're gonna resolve our arguments, our parameter with arguments. So okay. we have names assigned to the, the string Eva and um, the score is assigned to the to nine. Perfect. There we go. And then, <coughs> excuse me, technically at this point, then some automatic stuff starts kicking off because we've used the new keyword. What's the first automatic thing that we do by? So I'm seeing this uh, dot name. So that means that it, re it refers to user one. So we're creating a, an object. Is that correct? Or uh, yeah, you kind of said it in a, in a bit of a, 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 a not as backwards. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Yes. One of the things that we're going to do very soon is we're actually going to go through this line of code here that says, you know, this dot name equals name, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But what is this becomes the question. So what did we say? What was some of the automatic things? There's two automatic things that happen when you use the new keyword. Uh, my, what so, are the, uh, we have, we're creating an object, creating an object. What do we call the object? Uh, so it's assigned to user one mm. or oh, like user one isn't, no, <laughs> sorry. Not user one. We said, yeah, okay, let's, let's, let's incrementally go through this. Yes, we do create a new object, right? Automatically. Oh, okay, sorry, no. it's not assigned yet it's to okay. user one. <laughs> it's not assigned yet to user one. No, definitely not. We create this, we automatically create this object, or rather JavaScript automatically creates this object in local memory. And it calls it something specifically. Mm -hmm. I, do you remember what it calls it or like what it assigns it to? 
Uh, bring Tubix to maintenance. <laughs> no, Sam, I don't remember. <laughs> okay, Sam, can you help her out? What does JavaScript automatically assign that, that object to? Uh, to this. This, exactly. Got it, okay. Exactly right. It assigns it to this. Remember, that was, this is our other implementation of this. We had the left of the dot thing, and we had when we used the new keyword thing. Automatically mm -hmm. calls it this. And Sam, on the this object, we also get another like bonus piece of functionality. What is that other bonus piece that we get there? Uh, the Dunder Proto. Dunder Proto, exactly right. The Dunder Proto. And Sam, what does the Dunder Proto point to? The prototype. The prototype of what? Of the, the function, the, uh, the object form of the current function. Yeah, you should have like repeat yeah. this. <laughs> but more specifically, in this instance, it points to the prototype of user creator, right? Which is, yeah, like you were saying, the function that's being executed currently. We said, and I repeated it twice, it's a bit hard to follow through, but it, Dunder Proto points to the prototype object of the object form of the function user creator that we're currently executing here, user creator. I see people like, oh, Jesus. That is a tough one to follow, but you gotta learn it. I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. Okay, next line of code that we're gonna hit, because now that was done for us automatically, there's no code that tells us to do that. JavaScript does it automatically because of the new keyword. Sam, what's the next thing that we're gonna hit? Or what's the next thing we're gonna do? So the next thing we're gonna do is, uh, we're gonna set the name property inside uh -huh. of this object. Perfect. And then the value of that is gonna be the uh, parameter, uh, the name parameter, which in this case, Seva. Cool, next and thing. And then the next line, we're going to set the uh, score uh, property in the, this object to, um, the score that was passed in, which is nine. Perfect. And just in case anybody was like wondering where the hell Sam's getting that, it's right here. It's the actual, it's the only two lines of code that we see inside of the user creator function. That's it. What's the last thing that ought to be happens for us, Sam? And the last thing that happens is that this object gets returned. Gets returned. No code necessary, just gets returned. And where, where is it being saved? It's going to be stored in user one in global memory. Perfect. There it is. So now our user one variable is no longer uninitialized. It is now, let's see if I can get this. Can we copy? Let's see. Hey, there we go. All right. That was nice. I didn't even have to write it. There it is. Okay. There it is. And our Dunder Proto, of course, even though it was returned from the execution of user creator, the Dunder Proto still points to, it doesn't like lose that bond or anything, it still points to the prototype object here. All right, folks, now comes the big moment. Now we get to see the payoff of all of the work that we just went through. We get to test it. We get to test if we've accomplished our fundamental goal. JP, what is our fundamental goal in, in OOP, again? Data and functionality. Oh, so close. You're like 50% in the way there. <laughs> you know what I want to see, JP. Hold not on. I wrote it down. Let me see. Did you write down the hand motions? Because if not, that's, you're going to forget. In my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see this, JP. I want to see data and functionality. I want to see the hand gestures. I want to see the pantomime with it. Data, <laughs> functionality. It'll make you never forget that answer. <laughs> You'll never need your phone to remember that. You're going to be in an interview, a technical interview for a senior software engineering role. And they're going to say, JP, tell me, what is your stance on functional programming versus object-oriented programming? And you go, oh, oh my God. Interview. Excel, I love, I, I mean, I, functional programming, don't get me wrong, it has its place, but I love object-oriented programming. I love the concept of data and functionality and you're going to do it right there. And they're going to go, oh, JP, here's a big fat stack of money. Boom. And they're going to hire you on the spot with that pantomime. You know how I think about it when you, when you describe it like that? I come from a data background. So <laughs> I think uh, when you say it's like uh, fun uh, func functionality, it's like Excel. But then, ah. then when you say object-oriented, it's like 
creating functions on an object that you can iterate on with data. Or, yeah, I'm, I have to rewire my brain to not That's think okay. about data. <laughs> That's okay. Come to this workshop a couple more times. Trust me, I will, I will re rewire it for you. Mm. All right. Thank you. All right, JP. JavaScript hits this line of code. Hits this line of code. It sees user one. What does it do? It's uh, calling. Uh. Ah, come on, JP. <laughs> Haven, it's, it's, remind me, what does JavaScript do when it hits this line of code? It says, huh? Yeah, it says, huh? It says, what the hell is user one? Where does it look for it, Taven? In memory, In global memory. memory. Global memory. There it is, finds user one. It then sees the dot and goes, ah, we're looking for a property on the user one object. It's gonna be called increment. Taven, yep. does JavaScript find the increment method on the user one object? No. Does it panic? No. No, Never. why not? Because it, it hasn't looked in the Dunder Proto yet and it knows it can still do that. Exactly right. It always knows that if it has a Dunder Proto, it can look there. So it looks in the Dunder Proto, it follows the Dunder Proto all the way to the prototype object on user creator. Does it find increment there? It finds increment. It does indeed. And what does it do with it? It invokes it. It invokes it. Exactly right. It, it, it calls it. It invokes it. Executes it. And uh, Taven, just remind me, just you solo, no one else at all. This is your big moment to shine here. When JavaScript executes a function, what does it do? It creates a new execution content. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely it does. It creates a new execution context. Here it is. Oh, I love that. That was probably the, the best solo answer for that question. Typically, I ask a solo person and it's super awkward because everyone is so used to everyone saying it together. It's super weird, but that was great. It, it creates its own execution context, own local memory, executes this code or executes this function. The actual code for this function is, we look down here, it's this.score plus plus. It is this.score plus plus. Taven, you're doing well right now, man. So I'm gonna keep it going with you until you mess something up. I'm just kidding, I'm just Boom. kidding. You're gonna kill it right now. You're gonna kill it right now, okay. JavaScript sees this. So we're, we're kind of thinking back to our this rules. We saw two of them tonight. What was the, what was the rule when you execute a function on an object? So essentially when you execute a method, what does this equal? This equals the object that owns the method. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. The object yeah. that owns the method or the, the, you know, the left of the dot or however you want to say it. I love it. Which, what is the object that owns the method? Uh, user one. User one, perfect. So what JavaScript really sees is user one dot score plus plus. Okay, final stretch here. Taven, JavaScript sees yeah. this line of code. What does it do? Where does it look? It, sa it says, huh? And huh? then it, it says, huh? And then it looks in local memory. Does it find user one there? No. Does not. Where does it look next? Uh, global memory. Global memory, does it find user one there? It finds user one there. It does. It looks for a score property on that object. Does it find it? It finds it. It does. And what does it do with that score property? It increments it. From nine to 10. Right there, folks. Boom. We have just satisfied our fundamental goal of data functionality right there next to each other. We're being efficient in terms of memory in the sense that there is only one increment method one login method and it's all bundled up and protected not inside the global uh memory but rather kind of protected inside the object form of user creator not easily accessible you can't accidentally delete something on there if you're writing the code user creator dot prototype dot you know something you better be damn sure you know what you're doing because the prototype object is like a, a very powerful object that stores a lot of information, a lot of functionality on it. So you better be careful with that. So it's protected inside the prototype objects. We're automating two big pieces, the creation of the object plus the return of the object by using the new keyword. Folks, this is a beautiful implementation of OOP using the new keyword, using the prototype chain, prototypal inheritance. You'll see it referred to as all these different things. <clears throat> let's have questions on this entire implementation. Because by the way, 
This is not where I'm going to go, oh yeah, you know all that stuff we just learned? You're never going to use it. You absolutely, we're, there is another implementation we're going to talk about. It's going to take us like 10 minutes because fundamentally nothing really changes here. We just get some prettier syntax. But this is typical practice every single day in production level code. You will see this all the time. Let's have questions on this right now. I'm clear, ready to move on to our final implementation. I have some questions. I have no idea what's going on. Thumbs from everyone. Osha's good, Andy's good, Nate's good, Sam's good. Oh, come on, there's gotta be some, okay, there we go. JP's got a question. James, you're kind of like a three quarter thumb or is that a question? No, that's a good thumb. Okay, gotcha. All right, right now I'm only seeing one sideways thumb. So let's, let's first go with JP. JP, what's your question, man? Oh, you're still muted. Just, oh, yeah, there you go. Uh, I was just wondering um, when, when you were uh, on the right hand side in the top was where it, where you created the object uh, user creator. Um, yes. So, or, or you, uh, you know, uh, created that variable with a function inside it. I believe that's, um, I'm wording it in my own words here, but okay. um, Go ahead. it's fine. So a function, it's an object. So it's prototype, it's prototype synonym to a function or is prototype an object within the object in the function? The second one. Prototype definitely isn't a synonym to a function. Prototype is an object on the object form of a function. So you can call a, a function like a predetermined object? Uh, I say that last part again? Uh, can you call a function like a predeter predetermined object that has a process in it already? And then you could uh, a prototype within? Sure. <laughs> I don't know about the predetermined piece. I don't know. I don't know necessarily where I draw the line on that, but uh, yeah. yeah, a function is, is definitely is under the hood. It's an object, a very special like a, type of object. Yeah. Like a function already has a, a, a process in it. Yes. Functions already have certain things built into it, such as the prototype. Absolutely. That's, that's what I meant by the predetermined, but I, I guess there's, um, yeah, I'm just learning language. No, 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 totally fine, man. Like I said before, this, for some of us, that's going to be the hardest thing. For some of us, we get logically where all the lines are pointing to. You know, maybe you need to see it a couple of times to really cement it. But for some of us, the hardest thing is just learning the, the verbiage around it. But it is a very important thing, like I said before in the beginning. Master any, any subject, any, any subject matter, first master the vocabulary. Everything else will flow very naturally. Cool. Thank you. All right. Yeah, no problem, JP. I see uh, Carlos has got a hand up. Carlos, what you got? So I guess this clicked in my head right now, and I want to make sure it's a, a, a correct click or if it's a, great, yeah. a correct thought. But uh, then everything, in terms of data types in JavaScript, so it's in JavaScript, you, the only two, I guess, real data types you have is either primitive data types or objects. Uh, there, yeah, functions. primitive data types or composite data types is like the more technical term to say. Okay, but all yeah. composite data types are technically objects? Yes. Yes. In fact, in fact, if you've ever used the type of operator to find out what the type of a particular thing is, when you do type of on a function, it's, uh, it says function. It doesn't say object. It says function. But what the type of operator actually does under the hood is it looks at the object and it sees if the object has that square bracket, square bracket call property that I very quickly mentioned earlier. And if it sees that call property, it goes, ah, this is a, this is a, an object, but it's, you know, it's a function. So I'm just going to say function. It's a function. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, Osha, I see your hand up. Hi. Uh, yes. So it's kind of a side shoot of a question, but is this kind of why um, in MDN, when you're looking over the documentation and say they're giving you um, definitions of methods like filter, they say like array one dot prototype dot filter. It's, because they're built-in methods that live in this prototype? Yes, 100%. That was, that was beautifully put in a beautiful question to ask there. I love that. It's, like, it's starting to like kind of click a bit there. Absolutely. So uh, I don't typically go into this much detail, but I don't typically have too many people ask me this question. So I'm going to go into it just for a second here. So if you've ever wondered, how is it that you can execute? Like if you create a, a random object, and you can, let's say you call the object uh, foo. How is it that you can run the code foo dot has own property? Like, you know, the, the built-in method called has own property. 
And it's essentially a method that checks if a property exists, you know, whatever. But how is it that you can actually run foo.hasown property? Because you're sitting there going like, well, wait a second, like I didn't, I didn't create that property. So where is it coming from? It's not a property on the object. Well, JavaScript uses this same process that we're utilizing right now to make our uh, Anika's quiz game very um, you know, efficient. JavaScript operates the same way under the hood to pass around native methods. There is not a has own property method that's created every single time an object is created. It's one method that's stored inside the, we'll call it the kind of like mama object. It's the object with the capital O, if you guys have ever seen that. It's a property that's stored on the mama object, which is at the end of the prototype chain. So let's just actually, let's take this for just a second here. <clears throat> when you execute user1.increment, right? We just saw that lookup process. But what if you executed the code user one has own property? So you're trying to access like that native method on the objects. Well, JavaScript is gonna go, okay, let me find user one, finds user one, it looks for has own property doesn't find it. He goes, okay, but hey, I'm not gonna panic because there's this proto thing here. So it follows the proto and that proto goes all the way to the prototype object of user creator. But again, doesn't find has own property. So as of right now, everything that we know, you'd go, okay, well then maybe it throws an error here, but we know it doesn't actually do that. The reason is, let me zoom in here, blow everyone's mind right now. Here it comes. Guess what is at the bottom of the prototype objects? its own Dunder Proto. And guess what that Dunder Proto points to? It points to the next object, and the next object, and the next object. This is the prototype chain in JavaScript. Anytime you look for a property on an object, and it's not fat, like let's say that you actually did write bad code and you wrote like user1.bar and you try to execute the function bar or something like that. JavaScript is not just gonna look on the function or look on the object user one and go, oh, no, bar doesn't exist. It's gonna first, oh, let's see here, zoom out. It's first going to, it's first going to look at the user one object in memory. It's gonna go, oh, nothing there called bar, follow the Dunder Proto. It's gonna look here, it's gonna look for bar there. It's gonna, oh, nope, nothing there called uh, bar. Let's look at its Dunder Proto. And it's gonna go up to the next object and the next object and the next object, no matter how big or how long that kind of like prototype chain is, it's gonna keep going up and up and up and up until it reaches the end, until it reaches the mama object in JavaScript, the capital O object that has on it stored all the native object methods like has own property and, and all these other pieces. And if it still doesn't find it there, then it throws an error. So it's a lot more complex than just, oh, it doesn't exist there, throw an error. It's much, much more involved than that. Using things like object.create or the new keyword, it's allowing us to insert our own link in that chain, in that prototype chain, where we now insert our own kind of objects and we can put stuff there. And if it doesn't find it there, then it goes you know, on and on and on and on. That's a bit more complex, a bit more involved. So if that confused anybody, please don't let that kind of like, you know, hinder you too much. Everything that we talked about right now is like the fundamentals of it. Andy, I see your hand up, man. And yeah, then Carlos, I still see your hand up, but I don't know if that was from your previous question. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, so related to what you have just mentioned, um, I so just for a clarification, the Dunder Proto for user one, this and uh, all the ones that we've covered are linked because they're in interrelated, right? But when you say it looks at the next object, doesn't mean uh, JavaScript, regardless of whether there was a this or any kind of relationship, it would look at all objects? Not all objects. It's just going to continuously look at what the Dunder Proto points to. So it just all depends what the Dunder Protos are pointing to. So it really just kind of depends on, on kind of how your code is structured. Okay. But the fundamental, because this is where like, uh, this is where the, the, the workshop can easily go kind of like awry because yeah. now they're like, oh my God, well, well, what if this happens? Well, what if it's set up this way? What if your Dunder Proto points to a function instead of an object? Like, what if it does this? And that? when it really comes down to it is if you understand the simple mechanics that JavaScript, it looks at the objects, it doesn't find what it's looking for, it checks to see if there's a Dunder Proto. If there is, it follows it. And it keeps repeating that over and over and over again until it doesn't have any more Dunder Protos to look at. That's when it throws an error. If you understand that, 
any yeah. of those kind of like what if situations, you can whiteboard out and see exactly how it works. All right. Sounds yeah. good. No, yeah, no problem. Not. All right, y'all. I don't see any other virtual hands up right now. So I'm going to assume that we're perfectly clear on everything else. Yeah, right. Uh, let's move on to our last piece. So just to recap, this process here, solution three, using the new keyword, it's beautiful. It's faster to write because it's less code ultimately. Still typical practice in professional code. You still see this all the time. 95 developers though have absolutely no idea how it works and it's why they fail technical interviews. This is why we created this hard parts lecture is because at CodeSmith, we communicate with all of our graduates to find out what types, oof, to find out what types of questions they're being asked in their technical interviews. And for a long time, one of the number one questions that was asked is something to the effect of explain how prototypal inheritance works in JavaScript. Rebuild the new keyword for me. Like how does the new keyword work? And so many people didn't know how to answer that question. Now you completely understand how the mechanics of it work under the hood better than so many engineers. Before I was at CodeSmith, I worked for the Department of Homeland Security for like seven years. And there were some phenomenal engineers there. And I can guarantee you not a single one of them knew how this whole process worked under the hood. You now have more experience than they do. All right, so what is the next big piece though? Because this is beautiful, this works. But as I was going through, if you remember, like the process where we were explaining this bit of code here, user creator dot prototype dot increment equals a function. User creator dot prototype dot login equals a function. Eh, does it work? Yes. Is it pretty? Arguable. I will say that it's also a bit weird that like you have, you're kind of building this construct, right? Like, like you're, you're, if you look at the, the whiteboard itself, you can see that User creator is like this big construct here that's like kind of all bundled up together. You have the functionality of the function itself. You have all the prototype, you know, functions stored here on the prototype. It's like all kind of bundled up on our whiteboard. But in our code, it doesn't really follow that same pattern in a way. Like we have this entire process here. It's like, all right, let's create the function. And then as a second process, let's add a function to its prototype. And then as a third process, let's add another function to its prototype and so on and so forth. And then even the syntax, the like user creator dot prototype dot blah, user creator dot prototype dot blah. Like it's kind of, eh, it's not really great. It's not very pretty. It works, but it's not pretty. This was a complaint from so many engineers. People fucking hated this about JavaScript because there's other programming languages out there that do a very similar process of like inheritance and things like that, but it was done in a much prettier syntax and it looked much cleaner. And for years, JavaScript developers complained about this so much. Like this was, or sorry, other engineers complained about this so much about JavaScript. It's literally a reason why they didn't want to learn JavaScript. Like they didn't want to work in JavaScript because of this thing here. Like talk about a bunch of complainers. Like that's a whole reason. That's the reason you don't want to learn a new language, but they complain about it forever. Finally, in 2015, when ECMAScript 6 came out, the same time that we introduced like the new keyword, very shortly after, ECMAScript engineers also included a different keyword that was to help solve that process. Job, uh, you know, like Python engineers complained about it. Python complained about it. I hate that about JavaScript. Finally, ECMAScript engineer said, fine, we'll give you what you want. And with that, we introduced Taven's favorite thing, classes. This is why Taven, you weren't 100% wrong. It just definitely wasn't what I was looking for at that moment. JavaScript introduced classes and all it did for those of you that are like, holy shit, we have a whole nother whiteboard to go through. No, it is everything that you know right now. Everything that's on this whiteboard here is exactly the same. Classes just introduced a new syntax for it. Under the hood, how the memory allocation works, how the lookup process works, how the under proto works, everything exactly the same as what you see here. But what JavaScript did is it kind of bundled it up into one construct in your code so that it's much easier to kind of like reason about, it's a little bit easier to, you know, maybe add something to the prototype. It's a bit easier to get like a holistic view of what user creator does. So let me walk through the, the big, you know, the broad strokes of the differences here, and then we'll see a side-by-side -side comparison. So what we do here in order to create a class, to create a class, 
you use the keyword class. Whatever you want to call the class is what follows next. So we're gonna call this class user creator. Opening curly bracket, closing curly bracket all the way down here. One big construct. Inside the class, there is a reserved keyword, keyword in JavaScript called constructor. Constructor is the key word that you are going to use to define what is the functionality that you want to execute when you invoke that class. Or when talking about classes, a lot of times people say when you create an instance of that class. So when you invoke that class, you're going to execute all of this code here. So it's going to take in a, a name parameter, a score or a name argument, a score argument. It's going to run this dot name equals name score dot this dot score equals score. Just like we were originally executing here inside of our, you know, our function in solution three. And then everything outside of the constructor, but inside the class, anything that you define here in terms of functions. So here we have a, an increment function and here we have a, a login function just kind of thrown in there. It's kind of weird, honestly, if you just come from like a, a sheer like classic JavaScript background, there's no commas in between or anything. It's just kind of thrown into the class into like the ether, but anything outside of the constructor method inside the class, JavaScript automatically grabs it and sticks it in the prototype of user creator. So it's going to go in here. It's going to see increment. It's going to grab increment and then stick it in the prototype. It's going to grab login and stick it in the prototype. Whatever other functions are in there, stick it in the, you don't have to write the code user creator dot prototype dot login equals this user creator dot prototype dot increment equals this. You don't have to write that at all. You just stick it in the class. JavaScript takes care of the rest, but ultimately under the hood, exactly the same thing. Side by side comparison. Here we have solution three here uh, using the new keyword. Here we have solution four using classes. So, Originally, what we had is just the function. We store that inside our constructor function inside the class. Instead of having to write user creator dot prototype dot increment, you just write increment. Instead of having to write user creator dot prototype dot login, you just write login. How do you execute or create an instance of the class? The exact same way. Nothing changes. Look at user one is equal to new user creator Ava nine. User one is equal to new user creator, Ava nine. Nothing changes. That's it, people. That's the entirety of all four solutions. Benefits to solution four using classes beginning to emerge as the new standard. I'm going to throw an, I mean, I'll throw an asterisk next to this in the sense that solution three is not going anywhere anytime soon. It's slowly just becoming conventional to use classes. But solution three, which is just using constructor methods, it's going to be around for a long time still. So it behooves you to know both of those solutions. Some of the most, you know, a lot of times people ask, oh, which one is better? Which one should I use? It doesn't matter in all honesty. It's just a matter of preference. You want to have a fun evening? Open up a bottle of wine, pour yourself a beer, whatever you, you know, whatever your choice is. Go on Reddit which I am convinced are some of the most aggressive people in the world and type the question, what is better in JavaScript classes or constructor methods? People will lose their minds trying to defend their stance on which one is better. When it comes down to it, it doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't matter. It's still the same thing under the hood. It's just a preference of syntax. Uh, it feels other benefits here. It feels more like, uh, you know, other languages like Python, like Java, et cetera, that have very similar constructs for their languages, but fundamentally under the hood, it's very different than those languages. It's not like Python. It looks like it, but it is not Python under the hood for sure. So never make that mistake. Uh, if you remember solution three, look at that 95 develop 95% 95 of developers have no idea how solution three works. Check this out. 99% of developers have no idea how solution four works. And a hundred percent of the figures in this lecture have been completely made up just as an idea. But 
you will not be one of them that has no idea how this works because you fundamentally know under the hood they work exactly the same way. All right, folks, let's have final questions. Just as a quick recap from like three hours ago, solution one was using a simple function, a factory function, to produce an object. Each object had its own increment method. We quickly saw that was not going to be sustainable because they, you know, we'd, we'd run out of memory space very quickly as we scaled Anika's application to 10 million users. We don't want 10 million increment methods in memory. So we said, okay, let's use uh, object.create to create this Dunder Proto, this bond to a common storage place like user function store. That works. But we quickly saw as well, it was a bit repetitive and having global variables is not usually a conventional thing. So we went to solution three, introducing the new keyword that automated the creation of the object and the return of the object and you know the Dunder Proto connecting to the prototype object. And then we saw solution four, which did the exact same thing. It just bundled it all up into a nice, neater syntax and uh, syntactic sugar, they call it. So a nice, neater syntax kind of package. Let's have questions on everybody, folks. I see JP's hand up. Let's have thumbs. I'm good to go. I'm ready to get these challenge codes. Uh, I have some questions. I have no idea what's going on. Thumbs from everybody. Andy looks good. Osha's good. Nate's good. Tyler's good. James is good. JP's got a question. Uh, not many other people have their cameras on. Todd's good. Yeah, whatever. I just trust me. You guys are all. You guys are all in my book. You guys are my people with the cameras on. This lecture is super awkward to do when there's not a lot of people with their cameras on. Very, very weird. JP, what's your question, man? So, you know, it looks to me like creating a class, it's, it's almost like creating a function. It's just a little bit of different syntax. Um, and then you can just use some of the functions like, or iterators like increment and login, which will use the object of the class that you created. Um, what is just what is a big difference, and and how does that impact? What is a big difference between a class and a function and creating a function? Um, and what is the impact? Like um, like what does it look like under the hood when you compare them? Oh my God, <laughs> JP, easiest question to field in the world. All right. Easiest yeah. question. <laughs> Classes, they are functions. Oh, there we go. <laughs> How do you compare them under the hood? Here, let me, let me show you. Okay, so solution three, it'll look like this. Solution four, wait for it, wait for it. It'll look like this. It's the exact same thing, man. <laughs> exactly the same thing. That's the beauty of it. That's okay. why people, when we get through solution three and people are like looking at their watches and like, oh my God, it's like nine o'clock already. I'm like, no, 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 watch. Because solution four is going to go very, very quickly. Nothing different. Under the hood, exactly the same. Syntax is the only thing that changes there. Which make it, makes it a little bit more efficient or maybe uh, easier to... Easier to onboard, for sure. <laughs> easier to learn because nothing changes. Best way to learn stuff is when nothing changes. Great, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure, man, my pleasure. All right, y'all. Well, hey, this has been amazing. I haven't done this lecture in a cool minute. Like I said before, it is my absolute favorite lecture to do. Uh, let's see here. What else do we have? Do we have any other slides? Nope. It says, what's next? What's next? Come back. Honestly, we do the hard parts lectures every Thursday. It's either me or some of the other lead instructors from LA and New York. You get to meet all of them. You meet Dave, you meet, uh, really, you meet Kyle, you meet Shane, you meet Sarah, you meet all these people do different lectures uh, around these different kinds of concepts. If this was your first time tonight, any, who's, who's first time in this lecture tonight, by the way? A few people, JP, good, Isaac, Andy. Oh, there's, there's a few of you. Folks, you guys did fucking fantastic. For any of you that are like, oh my God, how did, how did Sam know the answer to that? How did, how did you know, Anika know the answer to that? It's because they've been here before. This is not their first rodeo. We've gone through these questions. They've heard the same jokes. They've heard the same anecdotes. Like they've seen this stuff before. So don't by any means ever feel like, oh my God, I'm just like taking a long time to onboard this. You gotta come back and come back and come back. Every time you come back, it makes a little bit more sense, a little bit more sense, and a little bit more sense. So if you're one of those folks, please come back. We do them every single week. It's been lovely. Last thing that I have for all of you, where is it at? Look at this. I even pre-made the links. There we go. I'm copying it. I'm pasting it into the Zoom chat for everyone to see. If you're in, oh, never mind. I just sent that to one person. Hold on. 
I privately sent that to just Nate. Let's change that. Uh, send to everyone. There we go. Boom. There it is, folks, for everyone. If you're interested in any of the programs that CodeSmith offers, if you're interested in the immersive program, there's immersive codes in there. Solve the challenge, get invited to a technical interview. If you're interested in CS Prep or JSB, there's a code in there for that. Solve the challenge, get invited to a technical interview. And uh, there we have it. Folks, it's been real. If you have any other questions, I'm probably gonna do my same thing. I'm gonna run. If there's a beer downstairs, I'm gonna hang out for like 15 more minutes. If there's not, I'm not even gonna come back. You're just not gonna see me come back after a minute. Uh, but if you wanna hang out, chat, ask any questions, you wanna talk about T-Swift, I love that. It's my favorite thing right now. Um, but other than that, it's been real, y'all. Fantastic job tonight, and I uh, hope to see y'all soon. Peace out, y'all.